Chris is a trusted advisor to the world's leading philanthropists. For over 20 years, ultra high net worth donors, foundations, Fortune 500 companies, celebrity activists, and wealth advisors have sought her advice to transform their giving and catapult their impact. As a philanthropy advisor, speaker, and award-winning author, she's helped hundreds of philanthropists strategically allocate over a half a billion dollars in grants and gifts. Chris's clients include the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, J.M. Smucker Company, Charles and Helen Schwab Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the Fujitsu, Blue Shield of California, the Avery Dennison Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundations, among many others. A thought leader in transformational giving, Chris has been named a, one of America's top 20 philanthropy speakers for the past three years. There will be a book signing after her, le after her lecture for her newest book, Delusional Altruism, Why Philanthropists Fail to Achieve Change and What They Can Do to Transform Giving. I've read the book, it's excellent. Chris is a Forbes.com contributor on philanthropy a global philanthropy content partner to Alliance Magazine, and the US philanthropy expert to the leading Dutch philanthropy media outlet, Dadeka Blau. Chris is also a frequent com contributor to publications of national philanth philanthropy organizations, including the National Center for Family Philanthropy, Exponent Philanthropy, Peak Grant Making, and Grant Craft. She has provided expert commentary and about philanthropy on the Wall Street Journal. Let me change the page. Bloomberg, Washington Post, Entrepreneur, NPR's Marketplace, Morning Report, Philanthropy News Digest, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Financial Advisor Magazine, and Wealth Management, and more. We cut it down. In 2017, Chris was inducted into the Million Dollar Consulting Hall of Fame, one of only 75 consultants worldwide who are recognized for outstanding accomplishments and are regarded by their peers as global leaders in consulting. She helped launch the National Network of Consultants to grant makers and has served on the boards of the Community Foundation of Lorain County, Ohio, and Horizons Foundation. Prior to forming Putnam Consulting Group, Chris was a grant maker at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and an evaluator at Stanford University School of Medicine. She holds a master's degree in social work from San Francisco State University and a bachelor's degree from Indiana University. As you figured, already figured out, Chris is super busy and a superstar. And I say this besides her masterful work, she and her husband Terry have raised five children. Yes, that's five children. So I'm going to rephrase my superstar description to superhero. Chris and her family reside near Cleveland, Ohio. And if you read the article about Chris this morning in the Daily, she is a longtime Chautauquan and might have scooped ice cream for you at the refectory. So on behalf of the Chautauqua Women's Club and the entire Chautauqua community, Chris, we are honored to have you with us. Let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Chris Putnam Walkerly. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you so much to the Chautauqua Women's Club for inviting me and for hosting this amazing speaker series. When I first graduated from college, I moved to San Francisco and began working for a nonprofit organization that was trying to support human rights in El Salvador. Now, this was 1990. Who can remember back and what the brand spanking new technology of the day was in 1989, 90? Just shout it out. 
Fax machine, right, the fax machine. The fax machine was like a miracle of technology, right? You like stuck your piece of paper in the fax machine and you typed in a phone number and it got sucked out into the world and like out it appeared in someone else's fax machine with all the words intact, like it was a miracle. And so the organization we worked for, um, we relied on fax technology and sending faxes much the same way that we use social media today to get the word out quickly to people to get them to take action. In our case, we would be at sending fax alerts and trying to get our supporters to call their congressperson to vote for a bill or against a bill or to show up downtown and for a protest or to come to some event. Faxing was actually so important to us that we sent faxes probably every day, sometimes multiple times a day. However, we did not feel we could afford to buy our own fax machine because all the money we raised needed to go to help the people of El Salvador. So instead what we did was we borrowed the fax machine of a neighboring uh, nonprofit that was located 10 blocks away. So every time we wanted to send a fax, we gathered up our pieces of paper and walked 10 city blocks, about a half hour, sent our faxes, and then walked another 10 blocks back, about an hour round trip. Again, sometimes uh, multiple times a day. Now, fast forward, and I'm on my first delegation to El Salvador. Now, to give you some context, this is a time during its civil war. So 80, 80 75,000 people had been killed, tens of thousands more had been kidnapped and disappeared, or had been tortured. This was a very dangerous time, a very sad and upsetting, obviously, time in the history of this country. And I'm, you know, 22 years old. I'm not quite sure what we're, what we're all about, what we're doing. So we, we go there, and we show up to the first nonprofit organization that we're there to, to support. And what do you imagine is the first thing that I saw when I opened the door? A fax machine, that's exactly right. Not only any fax machine, this fax machine was like as big as this podium. It faxed, it collated, it copied, it stapled, it practically made the coffee. Like, I was shocked. How could this organization that was relying upon international donations in the middle of a war afford a fax machine when we in the United States, the ones bringing the donations, could not? And so I asked the executive director, and he looked at me like I had six heads, and he said, well, of course we need a fax machine. We send faxes every day. And this was my first experience of what I now call delusional altruism. So by delusional, I don't mean crazy, I don't mean stupid, I mean donors often are genuine in their altruism, you know, genuinely want to change the world and make a difference and have a positive impact, but are holding on to misguided beliefs and illogical thoughts that are actually holding them back and preventing them from having the impact that they want to have. And often they don't even realize this is happening. Because imagine if instead of walking for faxes, we were, I don't know, dialing donors and doing some fundraising for that hour a day, every day. Imagine how much more money we could have raised to send to the people of El Salvador. A fax machine cost about $900 back then, and certainly we could have raised a lot more money had we been thinking about the impact we could have and not on the frugality of skimping on a fax machine. And this is important because Philanthropy is too important to mess up. So did you know that the reason we have white lines on the right side of highways is because of a philanthropist? So back in the 1950s, uh, on highways, there was no white line on the right side. There was the line in the middle that would you know, s separate you from oncoming traffic. But the problem with that was our eyeballs naturally gravitate toward that line for guidance heading us into the middle of the road and oncoming traffic. And there were subsequently lots of accidents and fatalities. Well, there was a philanthropist by the name of John Doerr. He was a philanthropist and engineer. And he was observing this problem. And he hypothesized that if you uh, drew or painted white lines on the right side of the road, our eyeballs would naturally gravitate there, away from oncoming traffic, but still have a guiding line to guide us uh, as we drove. So he was able to test this out. He got permission from the state of Connecticut, I believe, and tested this out on a stretch of highway. And lo and behold, traffic accidents and head-on collisions were reduced by 65%. So quickly, the state of Connecticut you know, started painting all the, their highways. And this caught on. And every state obviously now does this. And it's part of state and federal highway policy, all because of one donor who probably saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people.
Sesame Street, which I'm sure you've all seen, was created after a conversation between a documentarian and a funder, um, a vice president at the Carnegie Corporation, which is a grant-making foundation. Had a dinner conversation. She proposed this idea. He said, sounds great, and they funded it, and then got other fund uh, foundations on board, like the Ford Foundation, and that's how Sesame Street was launched in 1969. It was the first time anyone had ever thought about how do you, um, like, at scale, disseminate early childhood education to people of all economic backgrounds. And uh, today, Sesame Street programming reaches 156 million children in over 150 countries. And studies have shown that children who watch Sesame Street regularly are more likely to be ready for kindergarten, less likely to fall behind at grade level, more likely to uh, appreciate people from different backgrounds, and that these effects extend into high school all because the foundation was willing to fund it. Marriage equality. In a span of two decades, the number of states that were supporting, same, allowing same-sex and legalizing same-sex marriage went from zero to all of them in two decades. And this did not just happen. Uh, this was the result of about 11 foundations led by the Gill Foundation and the Haas Junior Fund, which is one of the family foundations of the Levi Strauss Company, coming together with their colleagues and about 26 different LGBTQ serving organizations and concocting a common strategy that they would then employ for the next uh, 11, I believe, 11 years that involved um, public education, message testing, um, policy advocacy, and of course, like electoral work. This beautiful hall of philosophy was rebuilt at the turn of the last century through the contributions of philanthropists. And in fact, Chautauqua Institution, as we know it, would not exist the way it is today without regular contributions and donations and grants, which make up a substantial part of Chautauqua's revenue. So philanthropy is vital, but also so is the nonprofit sector itself. You might not realize that nonprofits employ 12% of the US workforce. That's the third largest workforce in the country about 12.5 million people. And total revenue from nonprofits accounts for 6% of our GDP. And we all benefit from nonprofits. You or your kids might have come into this world at a nonprofit, in a nonprofit hospital, because about 50% of hospitals are nonprofits. Chances are you, and certainly your kids and grandkids, avoided getting polio because of the nonprofit, the March of Dimes, which raised money for research to create a safe and effective vaccine. Um, you or your kids, my kids, learned how to swim at nonprofits, at YMCAs, at Jewish community centers, and many of us gain leadership skills at Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H. We can exercise our rights to vote, our right to education, and many of our rights because of the work um, that was done to secure our rights by nonprofit organizations. When we go to restaurants, we're lucky now to be able to inhale clean and tobacco-free air because of public health nonprofits that advocated for that. And of course, we enjoy the arts, here certainly, but also in our hometowns. And it turns out that about 70% of all local arts organizations, theaters, orchestras, dance companies, et cetera, are nonprofit organizations. So philanthropy is vital, nonprofits are vital to us and to our society, and they're about to potentially get a massive infusion of wealth. Did you know that in the next two decades, um, it's expected that there's gonna be an $84 trillion intergenerational transfer of wealth from the oldest generations as they pass, transferring it through inheritance to their children and grandchildren. Now, we often throw around the, around the words like billion and trillion without really thinking about it, and I just wanna like put this in context so you understand how significant this is. If you took a million seconds and added them together, it would equal 11 days. If you added up a billion seconds, it would equal 38 years. If you added up a trillion seconds, it would be 31,688 years. That's the difference between a trillion and a billion and a million. So let me repeat. In the next two decades, $84 trillion is gonna be handed over from one generation to the next. And if only one trillion, one trillion, only one trillion of it was allocated toward philanthropy, think about the massive impact that that could have on the world. But my question is, how will that funding be deployed? 
Will it be deployed in ways that are delusional, or will it be deployed in ways that are transformational? Because this is too important to get wrong. Now, philanthropy does not refer to the ultra-wealthy alone. I'm not talking about Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos. Philanthropy applies to all of us. Um, we all actively promote human welfare, and we all, in various ways and capacities, donate our time, our, our resources, our treasure, our experiences, skills, and talents to help others. So I'd actually like to get a show of hands. How many of you currently volunteer, or at times in your life, have actively volunteered, either for your kid's school or, wow, that's like, I think literally everyone. That's awesome. How many of you have served on boards of directors of nonprofit organizations? Wow, impressive. All right, how many of you regularly donate and money to organizations? It could be $5, it could be $5 million. Again, this is a good group of philanthropists. And I'm curious how many of you um, are actively involved with foundations? It could be your family foundation, your corporate foundation where you work, or a community foundation. So that's a lot. That's awesome. So I'm going to share four ways that donors experience delusional altruism, four ways that they get in their own way, and then two tips for avoid avoiding it and increasing the effectiveness of your philanthropic giving. And you know, I normally, I typically work with um, large organizations, grant-making foundations, Fortune 500 companies in their corporate giving, and ultra-high net worth donors. But I know that some people in this audience are at that level. They're actually donating millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars through their own wealth, their family foundation, or corporate foundations they're involved with. And then some people in this room are donating hundreds of dollars a year, or thousands, or maybe not at all, but they're giving their time and volunteering. And so I want as I talk about the ex examples I give and talk about all these ideas, I really want to impart that this is, um, if, even if I'm giving an example of Charles Schwab's Family Foundation, it's as applicable to someone who donates $500 a year. Because these delusions cut across all scale of grant making um, and also the solutions equally apply to all of us. Okay, so the first delusion, delusion I want to talk about is that funders like to save money, but often will save it on all the wrong things. In other words, they have a scarcity mindset. And, you know, I've been advising donors and funders for over 23 years, and in my experience, this scarcity mindset is the most powerful, powerful delusion that gets in their way. And this is often surprising because many people equate philanthropy with abundance. After all, funders have an abundance of wealth, so wouldn't they also have a mindset of abundance? And as it turns out, not really. Uh, a scarcity mindset is a misguided belief that maintaining a Spartan operation somehow equates to delivering greater value for the communities that you're serving. Um, it means that they're trying to save money on things like overhead so that they're able to give more away to the communities they serve, not unlike the facts example that I gave earlier. And this might seem noble, this sort of like prudent frugality, but actually I think it's delusional. So let me give you a few examples. The first example is not sufficiently investing in the nonprofit organizations that you're supporting. This typically happens when people don't want to provide money for overhead. They want to fund the program, they want to help feed the hungry children, but they don't want to fund the administration or the overhead or the salaries to do that, as if that was possible to have a program that feeds hungry children without people feeding them. Um, and this typical, what you'll typically hear are things like you want to uh, allocate, allocate 99 cents of your dollar donated toward the program and only 1% for overhead. Now, this happened actually in our family. So around the same time John Doerr was painting white lines on highways, my grandparents were setting up a small family charitable trust. And now it's the third generation, myself and my sister Jill and my brother Pete who are here today, and our cousins who are the ones making decisions about how to allocate those funds. And a few years ago during COVID, my cousin, uh, our cousin, suggested a food bank. And one of the selling points, according to him, was, look, our donations, 99 cents of every dollar will go to help d distribute food, and only 1% will go to over overhead of the organization. And you know, the reality is that's actually impossible. Um, imagine it from a business perspective. So imagine you have a small business, you generate 
$20 million in revenue. If you only allocate 1% to operating your business, that's $200,000 a year, with which you're supposed to pay all your salaries, buy all your equipment, all your computer technology, get professional development, everything, right? It's completely illogical and impossible, and we would never expect this of a business, but people expect this of nonprofit organizations all the time. And if you think about it, if you believe in an issue or cause, like helping kids get into college, uh, and you're really passionate and you find an organization that you really are, have been supporting and they're doing great work and they're delivering great results, wouldn't you want them to have top talent, an excellent financial management system, really good fundraising so that they are likely to sustain themselves over time, the ability to have good marketing and communication so they can educate the public on the issue and recruit participants? Wouldn't you want them to have a great board of directors to provide excellent governance, the ability to evaluate themselves so that they can assess their performance and make continuous improvements? Well, of course you would, but guess what? All of that costs money, and all of that is often lumped into this category of overhead, which is somehow deemed as bad. There is this myth that low overhead is good, nonprofits should operate on a shoestring, and that they should be paid low salaries because after all, you know, they're doing it for the mission, they're doing it for the cause, they really don't deserve to make adequate salary. And what happens is this leads to a cycle of starvation for nonprofits. They start, you know, they, they don't have enough money to do what they really need, so they start lowering their salaries and lowering their costs, then they start losing staff that are getting poached by county government, which can pay better and offer more benefits, and on and on it goes. And suddenly they're, they're kind of asking for less because they feel they don't deserve less and the funders are happy with that, so they'll just give less. And it just is this like cycle that spirals down um, and, and, and forces them to kind of hobble along and patch together the work that they're doing. But as we discussed earlier, the work of nonprofits is so important and vital to our country. When I was consulting for Charles Schwab's Family Foundation, I experienced this. This is a foundation that gave away about, let's say $50 million a year in grants. And the average grant size was at that time between, let's say, $25,000 and $100,000 a year to an organization. And often I'd be reviewing proposals and nonprofits would be asking for $5,000 or $10,000. They would describe the amazing work that they're doing and how this program or initiative needed $100,000 or $200,000 in their budget and then they'd ask for five. And I would think to myself, my God, like ask for 100. We might give you 75, you know, ask for what you really need. But they were almost too scared. They were almost too fearful. And they just wanted to like maybe get something because if they asked for too much, they might get nothing. So this is delusional, this practice of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity, because you're basically starving the very nonprofits that you want to help. And it results in what I consider to be very destructive frugality. And this lack of investment also happens to funders themselves. So it's really important equally, not just for funders to invest in the, um, in the capacity of nonprofit organizations and in their success, but also to invest in their own capacity and their own success as well. At, let me give you an example. At the beginning of COVID, at the, at the lockdown part, um, I think all foundations in the world could be divided into two different categories. Category A was those who had invested a little bit of time and a little bit of money in the ability to make online grant payments so that nonprofits could apply electronically, they could review the proposals, make a decision online, and press a button and send the check via you know, ACH or a wire transfer. That's category one. Category two are those that did not. And um, it caused a lot, the category two caused a lot of problems. So when lockdown happened, I immediately began calling my clients and my past clients to check in on them. How are you doing? What's happening? Do you need any help? Can I do anything to support you? And I remember vividly calling and talking to one CEO of a foundation, and when I asked how she was doing, she began sobbing. Sobbing. And it turned out that they were in category two. So the only way that they could make grants to their nonprofits that they desperately wanted to do in that moment because we were all in crisis and they wanted to get money out the door and to be able to help the nonprofits so they could help the people that they were serving. But she couldn't because all of the only way they could make a grant was to write a check, a physical check, and all of the checks were locked in their office and they had no access to them. They rented the office, everything was on lockdown, and for weeks they had no ability to make a grant. 
all because they hadn't invested in themselves, invested that little bit of money and resource and time to improve their technology. All right, the second delusion that funders experience is feeling overwhelmed. So there is a lot that is overwhelming in philanthropy. Uh, funders are often overwhelmed by change, as we all are, right? I mean, we do know that the only constant is change. We've all heard that adage. But boy, doesn't it feel like there's been a lot of change in the past few years? I mean, imagine, like we never a decade ago could have imagined a massive worldwide pandemic in which we all would be in lockdown for a, a significant length of time. Nor would we have imagined school districts would be banning books, which they are doing now in many states. Uh, nor could we have imagined the powerful AI technology that we have today that is accessible on our phones and computers. So re regardless of what you think about these things, we all could not have imagined ten, uh, 10 years ago all of this change happening. And truly, I feel like today, disruption is our new status quo and volatility is our new normal. And the rapid pace of change can feel overwhelming to many funders. It's also overwhelming to figure out which issue or cause you support. You know, for some people in organizations, it's really obvious. PetSmart, the company, it's very clear why they would choose their philanthropic focus to be on connecting animals and pets with human beings, right? And right now they have their pet adoption week going on, so you can adopt a pet at PetSmart down the road. But most of us don't have that clarity. You know, there's lots of issues that we care about, and it's hard to pick and choose. Uh, do you want to focus on mental health or the environment? Do you care about access to health care or access to child care? And it can be overwhelming to simply pick. And once you pick a cause, it can be overwhelming to find the nonprofits that you want to support. There are 10 million nonprofits and non-governmental organizations across the globe. In fact, I'm advising a family right now. It's a Silicon Valley family. The husband is a tech uh, uh, entrepreneur. They have come into a lot of money and they started a family foundation. They got all the paperwork done, they filled out the forms, they have their 501c3 status, they gave it a name, and then they said, now what? <laughs> like, now what do we do? What are the issues that our family cares about? What are the right organizations to support? And so that's one of the ways that I'm helping them. The third and related delusion is that donors often feel fearful. Um, and, you know, some of this fear manifests in different ways. One way is being known as someone with wealth. So this comes in the form of like, what will, if you're an individual or a family, what will people think about us when they realize how much money and resource we actually have? I was talking with a donor once and she said, you know, her husband had sold his business for way more money than she ever imagined and suddenly they had this massive amount of wealth and she felt like, People she knew in her life, her friends, her family, began looking at her differently and treating her differently because of this wealth. And she began to fear like going to the grocery store because she'd go to the grocery store in her hometown and people would approach her for requests for funding for the, to support their nonprofit. It caused her to feel, feel very fearful and actually almost depressed. Funders often fear losing control. And one of the reasons, um, I think, that funders put, often put restrictions on grants, so they'll, they'll say it can only be for this particular program, you can fund the, the program, but not the people to run the program. Um, they put lots of restrictions about how it can be used, what are the outcomes they expect, when they want results, um, is fear of losing control. They want to be able to control their resources um, to, as they're deployed to nonprofits, um, and this can be delusional because as the funder, you're not always the one that's most aware of what the need actually is, and you really want to be able to trust the nonprofit that you're supporting to know how best to allocate that funding. Another way that donors are fearful is they fear learning that they're not right. So often, wealthy people, successful professionals, feel that they know a lot and that they're super smart, and we often res bestow respect upon the wealthy, regardless of what they, if they've earned it or not, be, or people in positions of power leading grant-making foundations, simply because of the power or the wealth that they have. Now, these individuals and you all certainly know a lot and are very smart, but just because you are a successful hedge fund manager does not mean you necessarily have the best solution for ending homelessness. But too often funders kind of believe, well, I'm successful in one area of my life, 
I therefore can make, create the solution for something I don't know nothing about. Um, this also happens when um, people make assumptions about what the right solution is. So uh, here's an example. You might assume that low-income parents don't send their children to high-quality preschool because the parents don't value, they don't understand the value of preschool. If only they knew how important it was to our children's success and lifetime success, they would certainly send their kids there. And so as a funder, you begin to launch a campaign where you are doing public education to educate those families and those parents about um, the value of preschool and how to access preschool. But the problem is you never bother to talk to the parents themselves and find out what it is that they need and what do they actually feel about this. And if you had you asked them, you might find out they know very well that they would like to send their children to preschool. They understand the value of it. Their problem actually turns out to be they don't have a reliable transportation. And it might take them three buses and an hour and a half to get their kid to preschool and themselves to work. And they don't have that time twice a day to drop their kid off and bring them back. But you would know that had you asked them. But you didn't ask them because you were fearful of learning that you weren't right. And too often, donors exist in their own bubbles because it feels safe. And they aren't willing to learn from those who are impacted, whose lives have been impacted um, by the issues that you're trying to support. Now, the problem with all of this is that um, it causes funders to feel, when they feel overwhelmed and they feel fearful, then it causes donor paralysis. It causes donors to stop in their tracks. We don't quite know um, the right path forward, what step to take, or even which direction to go in. And as a result, oftentimes donors don't give. They choose not to give, or they choose to give, um, they take a wait and see approach. Again, early in the pandemic, I talked to the leader of one community foundation and asked how things were going. And he said, well, not so great. Our board, we were about to embark on strategic planning. This was like April. And after COVID, our board said, you know, not quite sure what's happening with COVID. Why don't we wait until our next scheduled board retreat in September? At that point, COVID will be over. This was September 2020. And we'll see how this whole thing shakes out and then we'll decide how to give. And so they basically, like, the board kind of went on vacation. During a time of great urgency and need, they just sort of checked out because they were overwhelmed by the pandemic and fearful, and it caused them to take a wait and see approach. Or funders will respond to overwhelm and fear by only um, giving small amounts or giving to issues that they feel are safe and aren't willing to take risks. And it's hard to have an impact when you don't give, you stop giving, or when you try to play it safe. All right, the fourth delusion I want to share, and in the book, which I happen to have a copy of, um, there are seven major delusions. So I encourage you to take a look at the book and read about them. Um, but the the fourth one is that funders are often fooled by their own efforts. They're very, very busy working on lots and lots of stuff, but often it's not the right stuff. So they're certainly making lots of donations, making lots of grants, but often they don't have a plan for what they're trying to accomplish, much less a plan for getting there. And as American baseball legend Yogi Berra summed up perfectly, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up someplace else. So most funders really lack a strategy. Uh, they, ha they don't have a game plan. They don't have a strategic plan or a giving plan of what they're trying to accomplish. Or they might have one, but they don't actually know where it's located. I was sitting in the boardroom of a foundation earlier this year uh, with the board and the CEO, and she was new to the organization. And she said, you know, uh, I've looked around. I've looked everywhere I can. I've asked all the staff, and now I'm asking you, the board, do we actually have a strategic plan? <laughs> And the board kind of looked around and said, well, you know, there was that one, remember that consultant that came in like 2015? Didn't we have a strategic framework? Where is that thing? Let me tell you, if you can't locate your strategic plan, you're certainly not using it, and you basically don't have one. So if you, if you and often these need to be refreshed on an annual basis because as we know, things are rapidly changing all around us. And this is a problem, this lack of clarity of your strategy or a giving plan is a problem because it creates what I call donor distraction disorder. And by that I mean, here's examples of how this plays out. 
Your friend comes up to you and says, my gosh, you know, we're, we're supporting this organization that's trying to address Lyme disease. It's really important. This is a big problem. I'd love for you to donate. And you say, sure, I'll donate. You open your mail, and there's a solicitation from a nonprofit you've never heard of, but it looks compelling, so you write a check and send it off. Or if you're leading a foundation in your community, another funder might come to you and say, you know what, we're launching a, a citywide campaign to reduce infant mortality in our community. I'd love for you guys to come on as a lead funder and give us $100,000. And you say, sounds good, sure. Now, of course, these are all important issues to support, right? Lyme disease is a real problem, and of course, who doesn't want to reduce infant mortality? The problem is, though, that um, these shiny squirrels show up, and then you go off and chase them. And it's easy to do that when you don't have a plan. So if you don't have, and if you don't know for yourself what you want to accomplish as a donor, or as a philanthropist, or as a grant-making foundation, you don't know what you want, and you don't know how you plan to get there, it's impossible, really, to assess these opportunities that come to you to, to know, is this gonna help me advance my strategy and what we're trying to accomplish, or is it gonna take me off course? And um, you don't know that because you don't actually have a plan or a goals or a strategy. Now, I would like to share a resource with each of you that is a free resource that I think you will find very helpful. If you have a smartphone handy, you can pull it out and uh, I have a guide, it's called Eight Things Every Philanthropist Can Do to Change the World, Even When the World Keeps Changing. And it's basically a very simple, straightforward uh, roadmap of how you can create a giving plan or a strategic plan or quite frankly, a kitchen remodel plan, whatever you're focusing on. We create a plan quickly, implement it immediately, and make course corrections along the way because certainly we need to be agile and continuously changing. So, if you text the word plan 2021 to the number 411321. Uh, you'll have to enter your email and then it'll get emailed to you for free. And I think you'll find it really helpful. So text the word plan 2021 to the number 411321. Okay, so now I wanna talk about um, two things you can do to increase your impact and effectiveness as a donor. Now the first not surprisingly, is to banish that scarcity mindset and replace it with a mindset of abundance. Because decisions made in scarcity create more scarcity, and decisions made in abundance create more abundance. So an abundance mindset is a misguided belief, or excuse me, not a misguided belief. An abundance mindset is a belief that investment in yourself as a donor, as a funder is important, and of course investment in your grantees is important, and the more you put into yourself and your nonprofits that you're supporting, the greater the return. It means investing in the people, technology, operations, expertise to help you or your team or, or maybe your family uh, to, and your grantees certainly to deliver on their mission. It means being proactively generous, generous with your time and your expertise and your relationships. You're thinking big. So what do I mean by making a mindset shift? I really like to provide very practical, actionable advice. So let me give you a few examples. And the first is around really thinking big and beyond your current charitable giving budget. Whether you set aside $1,000 this year or $5 million this year to give away, you can think beyond your budget. So Mitzi Perdue is a philanthropist and she, um, her father started Sheraton Hotel Hotels, so she is an inherited uh, wealth from the Sheraton Hotel chain. And she was married to Frank Purdue of Purdue Farms or Purdue Chicken or whatever the company was called. So that's where her wealth has come from. And she has a foundation and she has organizations that she supports regularly. Well, she was sitting in a lecture about child trafficking and listening to the leader of a nonprofit organization talk about the problem of child trafficking and what they were doing. And she thought to herself, my God, I had no idea it was this bad. I have to do something I have to give. And then she made a mental calculation in her, in her head about how much she had allocated for grants that year and how it was already, she had already planned on giving each nonprofit a certain amount of money. She didn't want to reduce those donations to those nonprofits in order to fund this new group. So she basically thought beyond her grant budget. And she thought about a piece, an heirloom piece of furniture that she had received from her parents that was a, a de' Medici Cardinal's desk from the 17th century in Italy. And she thought to herself, 
I bet I could sell this thing and make some money, and I could use that to donate to the uh, organization. And then she thought, if I can do that, I bet a lot of other people could do that too. So she pulled out her Rolodex. I know some of you remember those. She pulled out her, whatever, her smartphone contact list, and she began contacting wealthy individuals and celebrities that she knew, appealing to them to donate things so that they could raise money for this, um, what became a, a, a global auction. She got an auction house in New York City to forego their 25% commission for the auction. She contacted PBS and got them to do a 30-minute segment on tr child trafficking and um, this auction. And here are some of the donations that she received. This is not your kid's school silent auction, gift baskets. Items that were donated included a yacht, a building, the, a sapphire and diamond necklace worn by, that belonged to Marlene Dietrich, the uh, actress, and a 69 karat ruby from the Qing Dynasty of China. Right, so because she was willing to embrace an abundance mindset and think beyond her own grant budget, she was willing to amass a lot of resources. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's ni nice, Chris. I am not the heiress of a massive hotel empire, uh, nor do I have Christie's auction house on speed dial. Like, how am I supposed to do this? But let me tell you, this is, again, it's applicable to everybody. So even if you give $50 a year to a nonprofit that you believe in, well, what if you invited 20 of your friends and neighbors to your house for a cocktail party, along with the executive director of that organization? He or she could talk about the, the problem they're addressing, the solutions they're providing, and the effectiveness of the nonprofit. You create your, you know, serve your award-winning charcuterie trays, and you get, get some uh, wine and uh, beer, and you create a whole party out of it. And you would tell everyone the price of admission is a $50 donation to this organization. Well, suddenly, your $50 became $1,000. And I bet a lot of those folks would be so excited and enthused about the organization that they would go on to continue contributing beyond that $50. A second way you can um, embrace an abundance mindset is to um, invest in, your, in yourself as a donor. And let's just set aside money entirely. Part of that investment is simply learning, like taking the time to learn about the needs in your community, about a particular intra, uh, issue that's interesting to you, about different nonprofits that you've heard about, um, you, you can go to this website. You might want to write this down. It's called, I'll spell it for you, G O O G L E dot com. <laughs> and you can do a lot of research on that website. Um, I, and I would say, suggest to you to like limit yourself, like four hours, five hours, because of course you can go down a rabbit hole. Um, and I actually, this is a homework assignment that Silicon Valley couple that I mentioned that I'm working with, this is their current ho homework assignment. They're working on this right now. I asked them to do a little bit of research on two issues that they identified to help them understand the needs and also to identify potential nonprofit organizations. But also, um, you know, as a, as a larger organization, as a foundation or a corporate giving program, you can also invest in resources that will help you um, that will pay off in spades in terms of your work. So that could be something like a succession plan for your family foundation so that you know that your legacy will continue beyond the time that you're involved and that your children will be able to take over the family philanthropy in ways that are meaningful to them. Or it could be refreshing your strategic plan and bringing in a consultant to help you or retaining an advisor to help you navigate your philanthropic journey. A third way you can embrace an abundance mindset is simply to let go of control. And by this I mean, you know, I was talking earlier about you know, those tight restrictions and the fear that funders feel in wanting to maintain control. Well, offer unrestricted funding. Talk to the nonprofit executive director and say, hey, I believe in you. I believe in the work that you're doing. Here's my amount of money I'm going to give you. Do with it what you will. I trust that you know the needs of your community and your organization best and that you will deploy the resources effectively. You can also ask an executive director what they actually need. So chances are, if you're having a meeting with them and they're coming to you for support, they have a whole pitch and they are gonna tell you about their great programs and pull at your heartstrings, which is great, and you can fund that. But you can also say, sounds great, but tell me honestly, what do you really need? And if you have a trusting relationship with them and they're willing to be honest, they might tell you what they really need. They might tell you that they're planning on retiring in the next five years, and they're the founding executive director, and there is no organizational succession plan, and they're worried about 
you know, they know that founders, there's often a challenging transition when founders leave an organization and they want the organization to continue and they need resources to support that succession planning and strengthening the organization. Or they could tell you that they, they're an arts organization and what they really need is a, a software and a, data, a database to manage all of their data. Right now they have you know, ticketing information in one Excel spreadsheet, uh, memberships in another Excel spreadsheet, and you know, uh, other things that they're doing. Like they're managing different spreadsheets, it's getting out of control, and if they just had $15,000 for software and maybe five more for training, they could really operate much more effectively but if you don't ask them, they're not gonna like sh share their dirty laundry. They're not gonna tell you the problems they're really having, right? So asking them is one way to embrace that abundance mindset. One foundation I work with, the Sisters of Charity Foundation in um, San Fran uh, excuse me, Cleveland, um, asked an uh, initiative what they really needed. And this is an initiative that was trying to raise money from the federal government in Cleveland to support a particular neighborhood with access to healthcare and improved education, et cetera. And what they really needed was to pay a grant writer $5,000, someone with expertise in writing federal grants because it's a complicated process. And so the foundation funded them. The grant writers put the proposal together, they submitted it and drew down $2 million from the federal government. So they're $5,000 investment resulted in $2 million because they were willing to invest and support what this organization really needed. So again, the ways to, a few ways to embrace an abundance mindset are thinking beyond your charitable giving budget, investing in yourself, letting go of control, and asking nonprofit leaders what they really need. And then the last tip I want to leave, leave you with, and then we're going to break for questions, is to create a plan that you can count on even when the world keeps changing. And so I talked about feeling fearful and overwhelmed. And one of the ways that you can combat that feeling of fear and overwhelm is creating a plan. And this could be a strategic plan, a giving plan, a communications plan, any kind of plan. It's actually quite easy to do. Ask yourself three questions. What do we want to be accomplishing? 12 months from now, where are we today on those issues? And what are the three most important things we need to do today, we need to do starting today to move us from where we are to where we wanna be? There's lots of things you probably need to do, but what are the three things that have to happen next? So uh, my husband, Terry and I, uh, we got married about 16 years ago and have been coming to Chautauqua together ever since. And each year, each summer, we would walk around the grounds and admire all the beautiful houses and think to ourselves, one day, wouldn't it be amazing if we could buy a house of our own here? And we'd walk, and we'd talk, and we'd admire, and we'd sort of hope, and then we'd go back to Cleveland <laughs> and then do it again the next year. We didn't take any action to do, to do this. And so about a year and a half ago, I said, okay, are you really serious? Would, is this something that's of interest? And he said yes, and I said, let's make a plan. What are the three most important things we need to do next to be able to potentially buy a house? Now, as I read these off to you, I want you to think about how utterly simple they are, we just hadn't bothered to do them because we didn't have a plan. They were, talk to a realtor who knows, who sells in Chautauqua Institution. And as it turns out, I have a dear friend, Monique Abbott, who is a realtor here, who I could talk to, because I, I needed questions answered, like, where should we live, and what should we look for, and what does it take to buy a house here, and what are the things we need to think about, and what's good and what's bad, so we were able to talk to her, which is super helpful. Uh, we looked at, the second thing was to look at houses online, like go onto the various websites and look at the houses and see what they cost and see what was available. And the third thing that had to happen was to go to open houses so we could physically walk in the houses and see how we felt and what was appealing, what was not appealing. Of course, we wanted a big front porch. Um, those were the only things that had to happen in order for us to buy a house. We had to do other things like talk to a mortgage broker, look at our finances. Um, but there were the things that had to happen next, and importantly, just by having that plan and creating those action steps that gave us momentum. We were able to take actions and have momentum. So it's similar. If you want to refresh your foundation strategy or you want to create a giving, a giving plan for your family, what are the three things you might want to do? You might want to retain a strategic planning consultant to help you. That person can interview, secondly, that person can interview all the people involved, your trustees, your staff, your family, whoever it is, and then you set a date for a strategic planning retreat, right? Those aren't all the things that need to happen, but they are the things that need to happen next. 
So I do want to suggest to you that creating a plan uh, is one of the best ways that you can increase your effectiveness as a donor, even if you give uh, $500 or $500 million. Um, I also want to remind you to uh, feel free to download this report that I think will, you'll find very valuable and, and useful if you text the word PLAN2021 plan to the number 411321. And, um, and I just want to leave you with the thought that I'm amazed at how generous all of you are. And, and the philanthropic effort that you have provided, I'm sure, throughout your lifetimes is to be applauded. And the impact that you've had, I am sure, has been massive. And we all make these delusional mistakes, and we all can get in our own way. So I also encourage you to think about and reflect on some of the ways that you might be getting in your own way and how you can instead be more transformational in your giving to create lasting positive change in ways that also allow you to transform yourself and how you give. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm just gonna announce that we're gonna... We'll start our question and answer. Um, if you can go to both sides and, or one line, whatever works for everybody. Hi. I was wondering if you could follow up on that last uh, inspiring statement that we want to create transformational change because the vast majority of philanthropic do dollars seem to go to putting band-aids on a failing system and thereby preventing change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think one of the powers of philanthropy is to, um, you know, f fund in ways that government can't initially, and to look at systems and policies and identify what is not working and create alternative ways of developing those systems or reframing those systems in ways that can create a lot of change. And there's a lot of power in philanthropy to support policy change and systems change, be it in the education system, um, disabilities, homelessness, whatever it might be. And that can happen at local levels, state levels, federal levels. And it's an it's a important power of philanthropy, as is the ability of philanthropy to be the first money in, to be that kind of seed money, to try something, to test something, to take risks. Um, because you can, you can take a lot more risks with philanthropic giving. And when things work, like you test a change, a policy change, or a systems change in a state or a community, and it works, it can be expanded across the country or across the, uh, the community, just like the example of the white lines on the highway. That is now a policy uh, in the federal highway system. So you're absolutely right. And one of the, also the delusions, you know, I talked about that scarcity mindset. And part of, I mean, when you think about it, it really is a mindset. So part of it is just thinking in our belief system and often thinking, like, I'm too small to make a difference. I can't possibly affect massive change. And so often donors will fund Band-Aid solutions and not really addressing the root cause of the issue. So I think that's part of the important part of being more abundant and really thinking about if we were to create lasting change so that this problem doesn't exist anymore, what do we need to do and who else do we need to involve to help us? Thank you. Yeah, so I have a question. Uh, what, what are your suggestions of uh, uh, donor advice fund versus a family foundation for, for family uh, uh, charitable giving? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So a donor advised fund is sort of al alternative to creating a foundation. And you can think about it like a charitable checkbook or a charitable checking account. So it's a fund that is housed at another organization, often a community foundation, or it could be at like Fidelity Charitable or Schwab Charitable. And so you as the donor um, make the donation to that fund. But the benefit of it is that it's then managed by this organization. So you don't have to start your own 501c3 organization. They handle it. They handle all the transaction. You tell them the organizations you want to support. They send the checks. They handle all the back office. They make sure that all the legal and financial issues are taken care of. And then they charge you maybe a small fee to do that. And so there's a lot of advantage. There's other advantages are, quite frankly, it can be anonymous. Um, that's a pro and a con, in my, ex my opinion, um, because I think that if donors are going to receive a charitable tax donation, 
that money is going into the, the pub, for the public good, and it should be known how that money is spent, but it is currently anonymous. Um, and it, you, can, um, you can also delay a few years uh, in terms of giving the money away. So when you have a foundation, you have to make a 5%, what's called payout, you have to give away 5% of your assets every year. And if you don't do it every year, you start to get tax penalties. With a donor advised fund, you have a little more flexibility. So it's helpful, for example, if it's the end of the year and you think, oh my God, I want a tax donation. I don't have time to start a foundation. Let me create a donor advised fund. And I'll just say one more thing about that. You know, starting a foundation is a lot of work. You're creating a, a 501c3 organization that has to be managed. There's legal issues, there's tax issues. It's a lot of work, and people often don't realize it and don't realize kind of what they're getting themselves into in terms of management. So they're equally beneficial, uh, but if you're looking for a, a tool that's easy and simple, you could start with a donor advised fund. So I texted to 411321. <laughs> and it didn't arrive. I put my email uh -huh. and I said plan 2021. And it said, which catchword, catchword, would you like to request? Interesting. So I said, plan 2021, <laughs> and it doesn't recognize it. So clearly I did something wrong. Can you, maybe others have had the same problem? I had the same problem. I'm kind of glad. <laughs> Just plan 221, no space. So anyone that's having technical difficulties, please feel free to come up to me afterwards at the book signing or at the reception, um, and I will be glad to help you. You can give me your email address, and I will de be delighted to send you the document. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Very interesting. Um, in the past, I've heard. You can pull that up. Oh, sorry. In the past, I've heard about a distinction between charity and philanthropy, and um, having the sense that the charitable impulse uh, from people may be they have less instinct to control or dictate or demand uh, that the uh, organization go on a shoestring. Um, uh, have you uh, any insight about that distinction and how it affects behavior? I mean, using the word charity versus using the word philanthropy? Correct. Yeah. So it's a good question. You know, those words are often used interchangeably, and there really is no kind of distinct, agreed upon distinction between mm -hmm. them. Generally speaking, the term charity is thought to be, um, you know, kind of a little bit pejorative, thinking about like the wealthy person bestowing wealth and, and upon the needy person, right? And so there ten it tends to emphasize more the power dynamic, I think, between those who give and those who receive. Philanthropy in the field tends to infer more a, a partnership and a relationship between those who give and those who are receiving the funds in recognizing, really, and this is important, that you know, a funder might have a mission to end homelessness, but they're not the one, generally speaking, out there like counting the homeless and, and helping homeless people get supportive housing or building the supportive housing or providing the wraparound mental health, substance abuse treatment services, job training that those individuals need. The donor is usually giving the money to other organizations to do that, but not doing it themselves. And so, um, I think it's important to just kind of recognize that funders are reliant upon nonprofit organizations to deliver on their own mission. It's the nonprofit that's doing all this work. And it's really important to see that as an equal partnership. That doesn't always happen by people who use the word philanthropy, but it's, it's increasingly important. Yes. Hey, so um, I've been getting some letters from people who want me to support um, saving elephants in Africa. and. I don't know anything about I would like to support the cause, but how do I select which one to give to? And the, I know there's a website that ranks, you know, efficient nonprofits. But one of the things that rank is what you were talking about, how much money goes to overhead. Mm -hmm. I also look at how much money does the executive director make. Some of them make like two and a half million a year, and I'm like, eh. So, but anyway, how do I pick like which one is doing good work when I'm sitting over here and I've never been to Africa? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So the question really is like, how do you, if you learn about a nonprofit, how do you know if it's effective or if it's one worthy of supporting? And I'd say a couple things. One is there is a website, it's called charitynavigator.org, that might be the one that you were thinking of, which uh, does try to rank many, many nonprofit organizations, I mean, tens of thousands, 
um, on their effectiveness. And so you can go to the website, type in the name of the organization, and it might provide you with useful information that you can learn from. Um, also, you can go to the websites of those organizations, and hopefully what they have available is evaluation results that they can share with you so that there is actual data that uh, explains what the impact of their organization has been. And then, um, you know, the third way I would look at it is if you are in a position, if you're giving a significant amount of money, is, you know, I would contact the organization. I'd contact the executive director and say, I'm considering making a donation. I'd like to learn more and see how they respond. If they respond and say, I'm happy to talk with you and let's have a conversation, or if they, you never hear from them, that would be both pieces of data that would inform, I think, your ability to make the decision. Yes. Is there an already created small document that grandparents could use to have an annual meeting of that family foundation where the children who are probably mature are given so much money to spend that year and to have an open discussion about their choice. And also the grandchildren who may be five years old, 15 years old, where they could start thinking at that age at the annual meeting of the family foundation where they would like to contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, there's, I don't know of a template that exists or a document per se, but I would actually, I wouldn't worry about the template or the document, I would just think about what are your goals? You know, what do you want? What do you want to impart upon your grandchildren, your children and grandchildren? Um, the values, um, the um, act of being philanthropic, the act of giving back to others, and you know, to, I would take a moment and like actually write that down, and really think carefully about what you want them to gain from the ability of you apparently giving them money that they could then use uh, to give away, and. I would actually just have a conversation with them. Talk with them about your own personal experience, giving, why you chose the organizations you've chosen, what it's meant to you, the impact that that's had on you, and, and that you want them to have some of those same experiences. And also, do that in a way that allows them to be philanthropic in ways that are meaningful to them, and not necessarily follow your own path, your own path, because they need to learn. And you learn through mistakes as well, and that that's okay. And then I would just be very clear if you are seeking to give them a certain dollar amount, that you know what you are hoping that they will accomplish with that, that you expect them to give it away in a, within a time period or whatever it is. I would just outline that, and that might be something to put in writing. And that if they need help, to come to you. If they aren't sure, that you will help them think it through. And if they're finding that they're not able to do that, to let you know that's okay. People have busy lives, they can't always do these things, uh, even if they want to. So I would really just think about it from yourself, what's important to you, and communicate that with them. And then the last question, thank you. Yes? Do your comments on family foundations versus donor-advised funds apply similarly to international giving? For example, a 501c3 in the US that has an, an English England, the money goes to England, versus there are donor advised funds for international giving mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That's something I'm personally grappling with. And maybe you're going to talk about international giving at one of your other talks. Um, are you thinking about starting your own donor advised fund? We so have, uh, no. Chap going but through. But supporting a donor advised fund elsewhere. Right. We now have a 501c3. We're thinking of abandoning in favor of a donor advised fund. Yes, yes. So a couple thoughts on a few different questions you put in there. So one is, yeah, you can, if you have a foundation and you realize it's more than you can handle, you can basically close the foundation and transfer the assets to a donor advised fund. Um, and vice versa, if you have a donor advised fund, you can make a grant to the foundation. So that's something to think about. You're not locked in stone. Um, and yeah, there are, I mean, you can create one uh, in other parts of the world. There certainly are donor advised funds and there are a lot of nonprofit organizations located elsewhere in the UK and other parts of the country that use donor advised funds as a way to um, solicit donations from people around the world in a way that's safe and effective. Yeah, did that answer your question? Any pitfalls? I mean, I guess the pitfalls would be a pitfall in donating to any kind of organization and just making sure that you understand who they are, what they're doing, 
um, that they have a track record of success, or it may, they might be a new organization, but you have had an opportunity to talk to them and learn more about what they're trying to do, and you're willing to support, support the startup of the organization. But otherwise, no, there's no real difference between supporting like a typical non-governmental organization versus a donor-advised fund. Mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you, Chris. She's gonna